Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to day two of this 2020 Alliance Annual Meeting. Um, I'm here today with Honey, the other co-coordinator of the Alliance in Action. And uh, we are very happy to have you on board for, for day two. We hope you enjoy day one. Um, and we hope that you will be enjoying as well um, all the thematic session of the afternoon. But uh, this morning, we're gonna start with um, some remarks from Hali Hassan Taka, who is trying to join us for the moment. Um, and then uh, we will move to a very interesting uh, plenary uh, discussion around evidence. Uh, before breaking out uh, into thematic sessions in the afternoon a little bit like um, yesterday. Hani, do you want to say a couple of words? Sure, just to echo, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for those who provided feedback yesterday um, at the end of the session to us. Uh, we received very, very positive feedback, uh, especially for, uh, for the thematic sessions it seems that everyone enjoyed those. Um, we hope it's the same today. Don't forget that there, are, there is translation. Um, if you go to interpretation icon, which is a globe, you will be able to find translation there for Arabic, Spanish, and uh, French. Uh, we'll wait for Ali to come so we can welcome him. I think Ali has joined us. Ali? Ali, can you hear us? Yes, <laughs> welcome, Adi. Um, so as, as mentioned a little bit earlier, we are very pleased to welcome Ali Hassan Taka, 16 years old, who is a youth volunteer working for child and human rights in Pakistan. Um, some of you had the pleasure of interacting with him yesterday for his session on COVID under 19. Adi, the floor is yours, welcome. We can't hear you. I think maybe take your um, headset out. Can... And now you're. I think we have a uh, last moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you, Ali. Oh, now is it okay? Loud and clear. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving me again the opportunity to be with you and to share my experiences and uh, what I have learned, my feedback with you all. So I will start a little bit with my introduction that my name is Ali Hassan Atakar and I am 16 years old from Peshawar, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa district of Pakistan. Uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa district of Pakistan and I am 16 years old. Uh, I am a youth volunteer working, working for human rights with focus on child rights and it's my passion to work for humanity. So I just enjoy it. It's not that uh, like for a profession or for, but it's for a cause. Uh, I want to make improve it, improvement in the human rights and child rights in my country, not only, but globally. So first, uh, I will just start with a little bit of that. How are the life of, of children during uh, lockdown or during Corona and before Corona, after Corona? So uh, before Corona, as we all know uh, that... Uh, life was going really good we all used to interact on daily basis physically we go to educational institution and we were enjoying our life but during lockdown there was lack of physical uh, and social interaction which lead to depression and uh, anxiety like there were different psychological issues which raise uh, which increases the ratio of domestic and uh, sexual abuse and there were many more problems faced during the COVID-19. Uh, uh, afterward, we move on to life now. 
now everything is going back to the more normal but it can be seen that uh, that everything can't be normal just in a few seconds or in a few days it will take a long time but the one thing which is hurting us that the fear that maybe corona be back and it what if it's back will we be able to fight it back will we be able to have the vaccine will we again have to uh, go to lockdown isolation will we be again a physical trauma where not be able to uh, meet each other and interact with each other so this was just a short overview that what was life during uh, corona before corona and after corona Uh, some of the important things i did during the covid or the lockdown pandemic was to uh, lack uh, uh, or some of the issues faced were lack of uh, uh, awareness lack of health facilities increase in domestic violence and increase in online activities uh, there is a link in the comment section mentioning about my article so it was my action and my work uh, during the lockdown uh, during the pandemic uh, to share some uh, techniques some recommendations with all the children uh, to keep them sa- self safe or uh, in cyber world as during the lockdown or during the covid the social media activities were very very increased and with them there was increase in cyber crime so that was some of my uh, uh experiences during the uh, covid and my actions uh, like raising awareness uh, after that uh, there is like a child reflection or ch- that why i ch- uh, choose what was my motivation behind being the, uh, uh, in an in, involvement in covid under 19 so it was like i was motivated to represent the children or from khyber pakhtunkhwa in order to raise their violence as we see uh, uh, there is a uh, lack of child participation so it was my interest like that a child should raise the voice for children secondly that to raise awareness among my peer groups my community and my friends because most of them are not aware that what are the uh, uh, effect of covid on their rights uh what are their uh uh their rights which are being violated what are the policies and action needed to be taken by national and international stakeholders so just like uh, one of the motivation behind was uh, to raise awareness uh, and some meaningful experiences as a children uh, in the covid under 19 was like it was uh, for a first time for me to or i think it was globally a first time to have an, such an international survey where opportunity was given to children to share their own experiences so it was a really uh, uh, enjoyable and important thing that uh, children were given the opportunities that children should be heard uh, uh, other thing that uh, how i personally participated in the survey was that i uh, in uh, uh, uh make satisfied it them by uh, uh, saying them convincing them that their personal information would not be shared with anyone uh, as i give them some tips that uh, never share your personal information because it's your personal information no one uh, not a stranger have the right to access it uh, never accept a friend request from stranger and it's your parents responsibility to know that what you are doing in the cyber world Tamam or uh, shukran 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 can i continue can you hear me yes please continue uh so like uh, i motivate that if you have any problem concern your parents and uh it's their responsibility to support you and uh they should know about the activities oh, you are doing so in a nutshell we can say that uh, it was right best uh, ethical child participation research and children were given the opportunity which was a really great experience and i hope that uh, we got some uh, important messages and we uh, should work on it in future after that uh, i also collected some key messages some observations 
that what were what's my own uh, key messages and what are the key messages of the other children from the community uh, it was like that state should take the responsibility to in, uh, bring uh, engage child participation and constructive activity like uh, child wants to participate but they didn't get the opportunity so state should take the responsibility to provide them the opportunity uh, the other is that civil society and government with the cooperation of children should ensure child protection and counseling services such like uh, child helplines uh, and uh, uh, initiative for children initiative for children safety programs for vulnerable children so by vulnerable children here just we mean that the children who don't access have education who are in labor I mean we uh, we children have our parents guide, uh, guidance uh, or some of our relatives uh, educated teachers to guide us but the vulnerable children for example those living on the street on the labor or who don't have access to uh, education have no one guide them so government and civil society should mostly focus on that alongside this awareness program for vulnerable children on child protection and hygiene during the COVID-19 is most important, which taken part, but I think there is more need in it. When children, uh, one message for the children are that uh, you are the main stakeholder, so you have to speak for yourself. Uh, raise your voice for yourself. Don't wait for someone else to speak for you. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. Ali, uh, that was very inspiring. And thank you to reminding us about the importance of child participation and the importance for you uh, to be able to raise your voice and to present as well the fantastic work you've been doing um, during the lockdown and during this crisis. Um, thank you so much for your participation and for being here. And I will now hand over uh, the session to uh, my next colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey and Ali. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Selena Jensen, the focal point for the Assessment, Measurement, and Evidence Working Group of the Alliance. And I will be co-facilitating co this session with Lael Soro. I'm so pleased that you're joining us today for this important session on evidence on the impact of infectious disease outbreaks on protection and well-being of children. Um, and as we get started, I'd like to firstly introduce our expert panel of presenters. We have here with us Josiah Kaplan, Child Protection Officer at UNICEF's Office of Research in Ochente, and Mark Canavera, one of the directors of the CPC Learning Network at Columbia University, and also the co-lead for the AIM Working Group. Josiah and Mark will be speaking about the ethical considerations in data collection during COVID-19. Mark and Josiah will be joined by Alessandra Guedes, Gender and Development Research Manager at Innocente, and Gabrielle Berman, Senior Advisor of Ethics and Evidence Generation, also from um, Innocente, for a plenary Q&A following the presentation and some small group discussion. We will then be joined by Georgina O'Hare, Head of Impact and Learning for the Family Care First REACT program with Save the Children Cambodia, and Daniela Ritz, the Ch Child Protection Learning and Impact Assessment Advisor uh, for Save the Children UK, who will be sharing the findings from a global research study conducted by Save the Children on the hidden impacts of um, child of COVID-19 on child protection and well-being. Last but not least, we have Ramya Subramanian, Chief of Child Rights and Protection at Innocente. Um, Ramya will be sharing lessons learned from a rapid review on the impact of pandemics and epidemics on child protection. Ramya will be joined by Shivat Brakania, Knowledge Manager Specialist from Innocente during the Q&A. So we truly have an expert panel and I'm so happy that you are all here with us today to share your knowledge and learning. Um, and during the breakout rooms, 
uh, we'll put you in smaller groups. So um, we'll have the presenters also pop around um, to speak with you in your rooms. Um, so that you don't fall asleep, this session will be um, composed of the three presentations followed by um, two small group discussions in which you'll be discussing together um, a few questions that we have put together and then opportunity for Q&A with the presenters. Um, and lastly, before we get started, just a few ground rules. As in any face-to-face -face training, please participate and respect other participants during the small group discussions. We also invite you to turn your cameras on now or during the small groups if you're comfortable with that. And lastly, if you um, go to your picture, you'll see three dots um, and you can click on that and there'll be an option to rename where you might want to add not only your name, but also the country where you are calling in from or the agency you represent just to introduce yourself a little bit um, as a simple way to get to know each other a little bit. Um, and during the small group discussions, there will be a timer indicating when you have one minute left. So you can stay in your breakout rooms um, until that goes off. And once the timer is complete, you'll automatically be brought back into the main room again. Um, so as we get started, we'd very much like to hear from you. So we're gonna put up a couple questions on Mentimeter. Um, in just a moment. Um, the link is in the chat for everyone to get started. I'll share the screen in just a moment. Thanks, Katrina. So if you could all click on the link in the chat box. Oh, all right. Okay, so far everyone, everyone says yes. So, um, so the next question is for what purposes? So if you click the link again, it will come up with the second question and you'll have a few options just to tell us for what purposes. And I see some people are still responding as well. Okay, we have one no. Just switching over to the second option for the question there, Selena. Great, thank you. All right, so the second question is now live if everyone would like to go in and answer if they said yes, for what purpose? And just re-click the link again if you haven't done that already. So is that, are those the responses, Katrina? It's a little difficult to see them. Yes, yeah. the okay. responses there. Okay, great. So um, I'll just read a few out. So to capture children's experiences, to prioritize needs and vulnerabilities, program designs to get their views and ideas. So participation to garner their perspectives. Um, yeah, ensuring we capture their needs, um, impact analysis, needs analysis. Great, so um, I'll leave it there. It looks like quite a few coming through. Um, and 
Josiah and Mark will, will speak more to that. So I'll hand over to you, um, Josiah and Mark now, without further ado. Great, thank you. And uh, just testing that you can all see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Selena, thanks so much. Um, and Ali, thank you for sharing your experiences and, and of course for all the uh, incredible work you're doing. Um, I'm only going to speak for a few minutes uh, to uh, focus on some critical top line sensitivities that COVID-19 uh, poses to the ethical uh, gen generation of evidence for child rights research. And then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Mark, who draw this discussion to a sharper focus on the humanitarian space specifically. Um, and as a general starting point, but I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you, while COVID-19 resonates with some well-established challenges uh, we already know around research ethics in emergency settings, uh, there are some specific considerations uh, relevant to this crisis that we should acknowledge from the start. Um, and these are all issues that Ali just spoke to very, you know, uh, very powerfully. Um, the spread and containment has been difficult protracted and it's required long periods of mandatory lockdowns, which resulted in extended isolation of families. Um, often these lockdowns are occurring in uh, uh, contexts of pre-existing uh, over, overcrowding, inadequate sanitation health and, and other aspects of inequality that have been exacerbated and the impact on children uh, from prolonged exposure to violence uh, to the psychosocial uh, MHPSS dimensions uh, and short and emerging longer term socioeconomic impacts are profound. Um, and I goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that uh, not all children face these impacts. Uh, equally. And um, aside from critical gender differences, children living in a range of uh, uh, other aspects of marginality um, are, are being impacted at, at higher rates. Now, critically, focusing on the research and evidence generation activities in this context also raises a number of additional and more specific risks. Again, I won't read through all of these right now, but a few of the top line ones are, are the risk of traumatization, or re-traumatization through research, difficulties ensuring appropriate duty of care and referral pathways, um, but also some, some more nuanced ones like the potential privacy violations and inequitable representation of data in the rush to uh, implementing remote data collection technologies, some of which haven't really been thoroughly vetted or tested yet. Now, in this context, uh, to help provide a risk taxonomy uh, and form a path forward in navigating these challenges, Inocenti has recently produced guidance uh, for undertaking ethical evidence generation uh, during COVID. And we divide uh, a range of considerations um, into three stages, uh, duty of care, issues of privacy, confidentiality, and consent, appropriate communications of finding, and so on. And uh, we also divide between stages of, of the pandemic, uh, the emergency phase, recovery phase, post-emergency phase, which unfortunately we recognize may uh, really come to represent cyclical stages rather than a linear process, given how uh, uh, current global affairs are developing. And across all these stages, we, we identify um, a series of intersecting risks, um, provide some guidance on how to mitigate them, and uh, overall focus on a couple key takeaways that I really want to emphasize to uh, to my colleagues here today. The guidance stresses that in light of the serious risks associated with data collection around children and youth during COVID-19, we have a responsibility to really first consider what data is already available and what can be analyzed rather than rush in to collect new data. Um, and as a corollary, we need to be crystal clear, absolutely clear, what is this data for? What are we advocating for? How are we using this data and where is it superfluous? Um, we also signal serious concerns about the collection of face-to-face -face primary data during COVID-19 with children. Um, and we, at the same time, do recognize some instances where evidence generation may be required, particularly when it's integral to the delivery of emergency services um, and critical support and programming. But even in those cases, we again stress that it has to be conducted with the utmost attention to the principle of do no harm. Um, and then we, we provide a series of additional ethical considerations uh, that can help guide uh, research producers and end users through a design process. Um, and I won't, again, go into too much detail here, but it, we, we prompt you to consider uh, not just your practices in, in uh, data generation, but also your institutional capacity to ensure uh, strict compliance, uh, whether you're ready to communicate findings with, with the kind of impact that 
we need at this stage um, uh, right now in, in child rights research. Now, all of this is still quite broad. So to narrow down to a specific domain of child-focused research, Innocenti has also produced new guidance specifically on research on violence against children uh, during COVID. And this guidance uh, focuses on contextual challenges and considerations that stem from uh, both violence against children research broadly and violence against research children in these very unique and evolving circumstances. Again, a few top lines. Just because we can collect data doesn't mean we should. No data is worth placing respondents and researchers at risk. And no data, and this is a really important point, no data can sometimes be better than inaccurate or underestimated data. Actually, I should rephrase that. No data is, is almost always um, uh, imperative uh, to make that choice no, rather no, than... No rather than uh, rely on underestimated or inaccurate data. Uh, we know from years of hard one experience of rigorous data collection ethics is important, not just for safety, but when you don't have security, confidentiality, appropriate training, you're gonna have underreporting and ultimately weak data, which helps no one. And data should be actionable. It has to serve a function of improving survivors well-being and prevent violence in real time. And we in the research and evidence community have the obligation to ensure that we can justify uh, and show impact against that, that type of action. Um, the research itself needs to take into consideration uh, and in, in a disaggregated way, what kind of research approaches are appropriate for different groups of marginalized children, um, including uh, uh, children who may be involved in say uh, child labor or, or migration and displacement. Um, and at Innocenti, we're also committed towards more gender transformative violence against children work. And we collaborate with others across the UN in this goal. And to that end, uh, it's important to flag the number of really critical intersections. With a parallel set of conversations, we've also developed on remote data collection uh, for research on violence against women and girls during COVID, which uh, likewise uh, face a unique set of risks. Um, the guidance also provides a decision tree for practically guiding the user through a series of critical ethical decisions just mentioned. And uh, as, uh, as discussed at the start, we're, we're fortunate enough to be joined by uh, two of the authors of these reports in the Q&A for further. Um, last slide, just to share some of the resources that I briefly mentioned. But let me stop here and hand over to my colleague, Mark, to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah, and I hope you all can see my screen. My name is Mark Canavera. I'm speaking on behalf of a small group of us that includes our facilitator, uh, Selena and Christine uh, Mikhailidi, who with me co-leads the assessment measurement, uh, uh, assessment measurement and evidence working group. I have three minutes to talk, so I'm hopefully going to get through these in one minute each. Um, I think Josiah has laid out some of the really critical ethical considerations for data collection in this very difficult time. Um, at the same time, as we're going to hear later in this session, um, ah, I'm hearing that my screen is not visible. Is that still true? No, we can see it. I, I can see, see, see it, Mark. Yep. We, okay. we see you. I can see you. We see Hani Masuria now. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, so you can see the screen. I'm going to reclaim my time, 30 extra seconds for me. <laughs> um, so as, essentially, um, you know, we, we're all feeling very challenged in reaching out to children. And as we think about this, I want us to also think about the differences between uh, data collection for research's sake and engagement with the children and families uh, that we typically uh, are, are working with and obviously trying to support through our protection programs. Um, we understandably are afraid of transmitting the virus or otherwise creating harm. We heard about some of the other risks from Josiah uh, recently. And of course, this is new, both uh, logistical and ethical terrain. So I understand that the fear is very real. I would second that, um, you know, doing no harm should always be the foundational principle, whether this be uh, engaging with children and families for research uh, or for service provision. At the same time, uh, in order for us to adapt our 
uh, programs to meet the needs of children and families in this time, we have to stay in touch with them. And so this is where a, a conundrum arises and figuring out how to do this in the safest way possible uh, is what is facing us. Uh, I think in the second half of the session, especially, you're going to hear about lots of examples. Uh, we also heard about COVID under 19 uh, via Ali this morning. And so thank you to Ali for, for sh not only showing us that we can, but encouraging us to do this in a safe and healthy and egalitarian way. And, and so we can, um, we can at least try while keeping these ethical guardrails in place. Um, just a couple of final thoughts in my three minutes and 30 seconds. One is that we're going to have to lean into the technology, even though many of us, certainly those of us who are older, don't really like it. Uh, this is just part of our new lives. And so learning how to use it and also some of the ethical considerations around it is really um, incumbent upon us. And, and Josiah mentioned some of the, the issues with the, the technology-based data collection, you know, not getting a good representation of who you're talking to, not being sure about the confidentiality and pieces like that. Um, but we have, if we're sitting on this Zoom call right now, we have relative access to technology and to KikoChat, our favorite new platform. Uh, and we just need to keep getting better and better at it. Secondly, is that many children the world over are sharing their voices more than ever. And this is happening in ways that are largely invisible to us. And to figure out how to ethically hear those voices is, is really our role here. And then to make sure that our, our programs are, are adapted to what children are communicating that they need and would like from us. Those are my thoughts. And I look forward to our discussion. Selena, you're muted. Yeah, it didn't. I switched screens, so it didn't allow me to unmute. Thanks very much, Josiah and Mark, um, for that presentation. Now we're going to jump straight into breakout rooms. Um, and you'll have a couple questions that we would like you to reflect on, um, which are going to be posted in the chat right now. Katrina, will they be able to see these in the breakout rooms? Uh, yes, because I've sent okay. it before they have broken into breakout rooms, it will still be in their chat when they're in their breakout rooms. Okay, so you'll have these two questions here um, and about 10 minutes to discuss. Um, so just as a reminder, um, if you'd like to turn your cameras on when you're in the smaller breakout rooms, that would be great. And, and we'll be popping around um, to, the, to the breakout rooms. So you have about 10 minutes for that. Great. Selena, I'm going to have the breakout rooms go live now if you're ready. Yes, ready. Thank you. OK, it looks like everybody is coming back. If everyone doesn't mind, just for the moment, um, if you could put your mute back on, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I think that's um, looks like most people are back. So I'll um, just jump straight into the panel. Um, so we have joining uh, Josiah and Mark, Alessandra and Gabrielle. Um, so if you could also please all turn your cameras on. And um, this is being translated. So um, please also speak slowly. So you might want to start with some reflections from your discussions. Um, and also just a reminder to the participants that you can post your questions in the Mentimeter Q&A as well for the panelists. So over to all of you. Selena, thank you. Um, can I start because I've, I've uh, been speaking enough here um, to ask Alessandra and, and Gabrielle if they have any reflections from the presentation, the framing questions, or perhaps the discussions that you just joined. Gab, is it okay for me to start or do you want to yeah, start? Of course. No, 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 it's all good. 
No, I'll just very briefly say a couple of things that came out in the group. Um, one of the points that, well, three of the points that um, Josiah mentioned in his presentation and that I think are worth stressing is um, there's a difference between involving um, children um, to um, inquire um, about access to services, design of services and programs versus asking children about their direct experience of violence. And I think that it's the latter uh, where we're particularly concerned in terms of the ethics and the safety um, um, of being able to do that via remote survey in the context of COVID. And alongside that, I think it's really important for us um, to, to be clear about what we're gonna be using that data for and whether the data that we'll be collecting that way will be able to answer the questions that we have. For example, I know that many of us are quite eager to get a sense of um, how much COVID measures have impacted the levels of different forms of violence. But in contexts where we don't have a baseline data, it's nearly impossible for us to attribute any change to, to COVID measures. So those were some of the things that came out in the discussion, including a question that will come up in the mental uh, meter about um, how we can ensure that there's a process in place to um, provide children who are identified as experiencing violence with access to services um, if we're not on the ground and if the data is being collected remotely. But let me stop there and hand over to you, Gab. Here we go. Okay, um, pretty much I, I'd like to kind of emphasize, and I think it's something that you actually can't emphasize enough around how we collect data. And it was certainly raised in our group, um, talking about whether or not you do collect the data and if it's necessary to kind of collect it directly from children um, rather than administrative data sets, et cetera, um, and the implications. So that was in terms of, um, and I'm very lucky because our team happened to note some of the comments on this in the sidebar, but thank you, Sole. But I think one of the things that was raised, which I think is also critical, is particularly if we're doing remote data collection, that the organisations that we work with have clear data protection policies in place that are quite comprehensive. And I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and ensuring that there are privacy, there is potentially there's privacy in these settings. And if that privacy doesn't exist and or it's uncertain to kind of avoid highly sensitive subjects and not to undertake this type of work. Um, and also to set up the platform to carry out the data collection, being really clear on the um, privacy parameters on the platforms that we actually collect the data and the need that given, particularly that this is remote and in, in the context of very highly sensitive questions, um, there is a very big need for highly trained and highly skilled facilitators. And this is absolutely critical in terms of getting kind of unbiased data and really kind of elucidating a kind of robust conversation about the issues and in, in ways that make children feel comfortable. And the other issue that was referred to in our conversation was the need for urgent referrals and how you do that and how you ensure that when you don't have the kind of face-to-face -face contact context. And also the fact that, you know, at, what is critical is an awareness of um, services and the availability of services, given that many of the services are actually um, overburdened at this time and are actually quite finding it quite hard to deliver the services directly. So that was kind of, we had a very kind of rich discussion in a very short period of time. So thank you to the team. Josiah and Mark, any reflections from your side? I, I Mark, visited. Please. Sure, thank you, Josiah. I visited a number of the rooms and caught a couple of minutes in in each one of them. And I, um, this tension between you know uh, privacy and the need to be in touch with children to adapt services to them is is one that many of the groups noted is not new to COVID nineteen, but simply reinforced and enhanced. Um, and and so that I, I think that Alessandra, you just referred to this and and really digging into the why. I I also appreciate your kind of focus on, you know, really think about the violence. And as we've been doing, you know, we are I work at a research group and and we have thinking it through really uh, in several instances, simply removed some of the violence questions from our surveys um, uh, because the it's not an immediately actionable piece. So unless you are a an organization providing services for for violence response, um, 
then then really think about why you need to be asking that question. The last piece, I can't remember who said it in the last group I was in, but was around not thinking through or the, that we need to better think through the needs uh, related to data collection for children with disabilities. And I just want to put the question to the group, is this not a tremendous opportunity for us to develop the um, methods, ethics, and actual softwares for developing some data collection tools and improving them uh, using using new media. Just a just a thought um, that you know this might be a moment in time for us to really visit that question that as a global community we overlook so often. Thanks everyone and over to you Josiah. Mark, thanks. And actually, that's that's a perfect um, parallel to the conversation our group had, which was on uh, uh, creating new tech platforms for reaching marginalized disabled children uh, in, in the COVID period. Um, and again, uh, I think you, you put it really well, that tension that we've all spoken to came up here. Uh, for us, it was articulated in the tension between the urgency of having to adapt and innovate and experiment with new solutions without much in the way of a guidebook on how to go about doing that process, balanced against the inherent risk of experimental approaches in this time of extraordinarily heightened um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities. So I guess the real question, because I, I, I really want us to all consider uh, the, the point Mark raised and, and, the, and the challenge he put to us, is this an opportunity for developing new approaches? Um, I, I would say it absolutely is, but it's also an opportunity for us to develop new ethical guidance for managing the safe and careful application of innovation in these circumstances. And part of that for me uh, in a, terms of technology, in terms of online digital, is not just considering safeguarding children's anonymity from uh, external data breaches or, or external parties, but also being aware of the new digital spaces that we are introducing children uh, and their families to through new technologies we're, we're rolling out. But I'd love to hear, um, Alessandra, Gab, Mark, any additional thoughts on that? Because I think that's that's really pertinent to the conversation right now. Maybe I'll just have one closing thought from Alessandra before we move um, Thank you. Sorry, just to say, you know, uh, in terms of Mark's um, point about whether you're an organization providing services for survivors of violence, um, the question that we've asked ourselves is, how much more do we need to know? You know, we had extraordinarily high levels of violence against children, even prior to COVID. I'm reviewing a paper now, Nigeria, over 70% of children experiencing violent discipline. Can we not act on the basis of that data, understanding that we need to be prepared, that if anything, COVID will increase those levels. It's unlikely to decrease those levels. So is it important for us now, I'm talking about the immediate, um, pandemic uh, response? Is it important for us to know that it's increased by 5%, 10%, or should we be investing that energy in figuring out, as you suggest, Mark, how to reach those children better uh, and more effectively? And so that's also where we're coming from. Um, and that's my last point. Thank you. Great, thank you um, all very much. Mark, Josiah, Alessandra, Gabrielle, um, and I can see from your questions um, all coming in that many of you listening and participating have understandable reservations about navigating this new ethical terrain and data collection, um, as well as in service provision and um, possibilities for engaging meaningfully with children. Um, and while do no harm should always be the foundational principle, service providers um, also have an ethical obligation, as Mark mentioned, to remain in contact with those they serve and to deliver their services in accordance with um, stated needs. Um, and related to broader data collection for research and assessment and ME activities, we must also remember that children have the right to participate and to be heard while ensuring that the ethical safeguards are in place and that principles of confidentiality and do no harm are always followed. Um, and just on this one year anniversary of the updated child protection minimum standards, I'd also like to encourage you all to turn to the CPMS for further guidance and standards, which you can find online on the Alliance website if you do not have a hard copy. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next presenters, Georgina O'Hare and, and Daniela Ritz, who will present on the Save the Children's Global Research Study 
which highlights the impact of the pandemic, um, not only on children's protection and well-being, but also on their rights um, to health education and a decent standard of living. So over to you, Georgina and Danny. Thank you so much, Selena, uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity to present to you today. Uh, if we can just go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so as Selena mentioned, Save the Children has undertaken a global research study uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on children's health, learning, rights, and protection. Uh, for this particular presentation, we'll be focusing on the child protection and wellbeing thematic report uh, and some of the very high level findings and recommendations uh, given we only have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also providing links to the full report uh, should you be interested and want to go and learn more. So the research was implemented in 46 countries uh, with nearly 32,000 adult respondents and over 13,000 child respondents aged 11 to 17. Uh, the research sampled three distinct population groups, uh, but the findings that we're going to present today uh, save the children program participant group um, who had remote contact details. So all of this was done by phone and email. Uh, there were a number of study areas related to child protection in which relevant questions were asked, uh, including violence in the home and parenting methods, uh, mental health and psychosocial well-being, separation of children, child labour, online safety uh, and access to services. Uh, there were a number of limitations, of course, with the study, uh, which are detailed in full in the report. Yeah, next slide. So where both the caregiver and a child had completed the survey, uh, nearly one third of households had either a child or caregiver reporting that there had been violence occurring in the home, uh, which included either children and or adults uh, being verbally or physically abused. There are a number of variables which led to violence being reported at significantly higher rates by children and adults, uh, including the caregiver having a disability, uh, respondents living in urban locations, uh, the family having moved from where they normally live due to COVID-19 uh, and income uh, being lost by the household uh, due to COVID-19 as well. Uh, it was also higher when schools were closed and the child was not attending, the longer the household had been in home confinement and also the higher the number of children living in the household. Ooh, this poll keeps coming up. Uh, when a caregiver reported reduced mental health and psychosocial well-being, there was also higher reporting of violence. And this was also the case for uh, when there was a reported lack of access to support. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so over three quarters of caregivers reported an increase in their use of positive parenting methods with their children, uh, while conversely, just over one in five reported an increase in the use of negative or violent parenting methods, uh, with 17% reporting an increase in both. So interestingly, with this research, we saw a co-occurrence of both po positive and negative changes in parenting methods and an overlap in risk and protective factors. Uh, so several of the variables that we looked at, uh, including when more than half of the income had been lost due to COVID-19, uh, caregiver reported reduced mental health and psychosocial wellbeing, lack of access to supports, uh, and the number of activities or engagement caregivers had with the child they were significantly associated with both increased use of positive and uh, negative or violent parenting methods. So the report makes a number of recommendations. Uh, so we looked across programming, advocacy, uh, policy, uh, donors, for where Save the Children should be looking uh, to respond to these findings. 
So it included uplift and investment in uh, positive parenting programming, uh, including on continuing to build the evidence base for it. Uh, ensuring the accessibility of the programs and messages, particularly for parents and caregivers with a disability, those in urban areas and those on the move. So where we really saw that there was high levels of reporting of violence. Uh, also the importance of multi-sectoral programming uh, that address the interconnected issues of MHPSS and livelihoods, uh, including, uh, uh, including cash and voucher assistance, uh, in support of violence in the home programming. Uh, also the need to review and update referral and reporting systems for children, uh, where particularly in light of schools being closed uh, and further consideration, including programming and research uh, to really understand this co-occurrence of positive and negative changes in parenting methods and the overlapping risk and protective factors that we saw. So in terms of separation of children, 6% uh, of caregivers uh, that we surveyed reported separation of children uh, because of COVID-19. So when a caregiver reported that they moved from where they normally lived due to COVID-19, uh, this was significantly higher at 23% uh, compared to 5% when they hadn't moved. A number of other variables also had an association with reporting of violence at a higher rate, uh, including the caregiver having a disability, there being household illness and the age of the caregiver. Uh, so particularly when they were over 60 years old. Uh, and again, a number of recommendations for uh, how we address separation of children uh, during COVID-19. Uh, including tailoring programming to identify and support caregivers in which disability, age or illness are a factor, as well as families on the move, given we know that that's where the association is with separation. Uh, cash and social protection programming to address income livelihoods issues as a root cause of family separation, uh, as well as ensuring strong links with health sector response. Uh, to support identification, referral to appropriate care and follow up. Uh, also a need to ensure contingency plans are developed with clear trigger points to respond to family separation, as well as government led emergency alternative care plans. Uh, we also felt that we actually needed further research on where, what and why children are being separated from their family, uh, which didn't come through the survey. Okay, thanks Georgina. So um, my name is Daniela Ritz and I'll be um, talking you through some of the key findings on the impact on mental health and psychosocial well-being of the study. And um, both children and their caregivers overwhelmingly reported an increase in negative feelings, feelings since the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, and whilst this was 80% um, of children who reported this, it was 89% for the caregivers. Around three in four children reported being more worried and more than half were more sad and also felt less safe uh, compared to before. Um, we also found that there was a number of variables that led to an increase in negative feelings for children, um, but particularly uh, being in touch with their friends and also being able to play had an immense effect um, on children's feelings. So just in this, as an example, more than half the children who were not in touch with their friends reported being less happy, more worried and less safe, and that compares to only around 5% of children who were actually able to meet uh, with their friends in person or inter and interact with them virtually. Um, interestingly, um, the number of weeks of school closure rather than the weeks in lockdown had a strong influence on reported negative feelings. Um, the reporting of increase in negative feelings rose from 62% in children and 83% in adults uh, at week one to four to 96% of children and 95% um, of caregivers by week 17 to 19 of school closures. Uh, next slide. 
Um, additionally, um, just under half the caregivers also observed changes in the behavior of their children, indicating signs of distress. So for instance, uh, levels of change in emotional regulation, more aggressive behavior, um, and bedwetting in children were between three to almost five times higher um, when six or more children uh, lived in the household compared to when there was only one child in the household. And then also um, children with disabilities were more than three times more likely to show bedwetting and unusual crying and screaming. Children whose caregivers reported that there was violence in the home were more than four times more likely to show more aggressive behavior and violence against others. Next slide, please. So based on these findings, um, we also have some recommendations in support of uh, mental health and psychosocial well-being of children and their caregivers. And these include um, the investment and in the scale up and integration of high quality MHPSS programs across sectors in the response. Um, also MHPSS interventions for children and their caregivers uh, should be provided across the continuum of care. And also the uh, recognizing the connection between children and strengthening um, of supportive peer environment should be increased and as well as um, support is needed for parents and caregivers for their own mental health and psychosocial well-being and in support of their care for the children. Next slide, please. So this study um, has been important in bringing us closer to children's experience of the impacts of COVID-19 and also signals important considerations for their protection and well-being. And the recommendations arising from the studies, uh, study findings sit within the broader calls to prioritize child protection within COVID-19, uh, within the COVID-19 response that were also made by the UN Secretary General and are agreed by states, uh, multilateral and civil society organizations. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georgina and Danny. Um, and Claire has shared the link to the study, the report in the chat for anyone. I'm gonna jump straight into um, handing over to you, Ramya. Can you hear me, Selena? And can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, uh, thank you for including our work in this uh, panel. Um, as introduced earlier, I'm Ramya. I work with the UNICEF Office of Research in Chenti, and I'm going to speak about a rapid evidence review that uh, my colleague Shivit Prakrenya, who will be here for the discussion, uh, led with uh, many colleagues um, around uh, the impacts of pandemics and epidemics on child protection outcomes. And kind of in, in, in tune with the discussions today, one of our thoughts was how can we uh, instead of sort of trying to collect data on these difficult issues at a very difficult time, how can we marshal the evidence that we already have from previous pandemics and epidemics in terms of the impacts on child protection? Um, so the, as mentioned, there was a great interest at the very beginning of the pandemic to understand what all of these rapid developments meant for children, uh, for their development, their safety, well-being, protection from harm abuse and violence, all the issues we've discussed today. And so we've worked on this uh, rapid review of evidence, uh, synthesizing evidence. And I'll describe it a little bit because a, 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 a an evidence review is not a simple thing. And I think in the process of doing this, and my colleague Shit can speak to it more, we found a way to try and do this as rapidly as we could um, while maintaining a certain level of rigor to make the, the report a credible one uh, in terms of synthesizing learning. So we had three questions uh, that focused the review broadly. What are the effects of pandemics and epidemics on child protection outcomes? Uh, what are the effects of pandemics and epidemics, and particularly in terms of infection control measures? As we all know, it's not the pandemic itself, or, but it's the way in which uh, policies were developed to, to contain the spread. What were their effects specifically on child protection outcomes? And then in particular to say, how do we, what can we learn about the effects of these pandemics and epidemics and the infection control measures for particularly children and adolescents in vulnerable circumstances or at risk 
of all of the issues of protection that we've talked about. And I think that was a very important aspect of what we covered in the, in the framing of this research. We had a uh, quite a, you know, clearly defined uh, conceptual framework to guide the, the scoping of the ev ev available evidence. As you can see, we covered quite a few, um, the literature on quite a few um, epidemics, at least we searched for them. It included COVID to see anything that had come out earlier, but in the meantime, looking at Zika, SARS, MERS, HIV, H1N1, and Ebola as the body of literature that could guide us to see what might be in store uh, when we look at COVID-19. Although, of course, these were diff different and also geographically different focused with different transmission mechanisms and so on. Uh, we looked in for the infection control measures. We looked at uh, a range of things you are all familiar with, so I won't spend too much time. But the quarantine, social distancing, uh, movement restrictions, suspension of services, including schools, health, and social services, but also the closure of non-essential businesses and, of course, the impact on livelihoods. Um, we looked at what these, uh, we looked for what these uh, studies would tell us about the moderators, so really trying to get at some of the pathways of impact. And then we looked at the outcomes themselves, of course. So outcomes operating at the community level, outcomes operating at the household level, and uh, outcomes that directly impacted on children, including, of course, involvement in hazardous work, exploitation, unpaid care and domestic work, and then a lot of issues related to also violence, uh, family separation and abandonment, and many of the things we've already heard about, including in the previous presentation. Um, so in the review that was done rapidly, the, the team looked at about 6,000 studies, of which 53 studies met the scope. And these included 16 systematic reviews, 16 non-systematic reviews, and 22 cross-sectional studies. And the evidence that was found was overwhelmingly produced in the context of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, and to a lesser extent from Ebola in West Africa. So two, two particular kinds of um, uh, pandemics or outbreaks, infectious disease outbreaks, where uh, the literature was a bit stronger than on, on others. And I think this is kind of an important point to note. Um, in terms of the inclusion, I know many times when we do reviews of this kind, people wonder how did 6,000 just uh, you know, come down into 53. But we, the focus, there has to be a scope and a focus, uh, was really the exclusion was we, I think the, the, the review excluded papers that were purely conceptual or theoretical, or where there was no report on the methodology used. And there were additional inclusion, exclusion uh, criteria, but I don't want to go into too much detail. We do hope that you will read the report and the brief, uh, which is sort of hyperlinked in this presentation. Um, we also didn't look at academic thesis, for example or single studies from HIV, because HIV, there was a significant body of work, but also a lot of systematic reviews. Now, in terms of some of the limitations, of course, every pandemic and epidemic is unique. Uh, the, the containment measures are unique. In this case, COVID-19 was unprecedented in its global coverage and in the, in the rapid way it was transmitted around the world. Um, and of course, there are always limitations to generalizability and applicability of studies that are done in context. Um, so we always have to bear that in mind. But even so, we, we learn a lot. And I think these, these learnings are possibly important to, uh, to table because they, they plug that, that gap that is needed perhaps for advocacy, where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can actually already uh, point to risk factors that have been associated in previous experiences. And so the outcomes, of course, as we know, are always multilayered with immediate and intermediate outcomes. These are intersecting issues. But when we look at them, Clearly, one of the big, I think, issues that came out was in the context of, of course, driven by the HIV. Uh, being offered is clearly a big risk factor. It's clearly a risk factor for a whole host of protection risks uh, for children. Uh, we found, of course, the literature also tells us that stigma and discrimination is a big associated uh, factor, uh, which we will also see in the context of COVID-19, uh, po possibly, and I think some, some of the... Um, accounts have already uh, addressed that. Of course, the, the reduction in household income were also associated uh, uh, findings or impacts of these other pandemics and epidemics due to sickness, bereavement, and a whole host of other insecurities, uh, including livelihoods impacts. The illness or death of breadwinners, of course, even if it's a single um, uh, parent or single caregiver not, not being offered completely, 
also has a huge impact on children. And of course, the outcomes include then associated with all of these child work, early marriage, early and adolescent pregnancy, child abuse, sexual violence, and access to services. And of course, the access to services we've looked at, particularly in COVID-19, there is a huge amount of self restrictions that people place on themselves uh, in, in fear of the, what, what interaction will do. That we've also seen in some communities very tough policing on communities, preventing them from going out to uh, seek help. So a whole host of ways in which uh, access to the, the access to services has been disrupted, including, including, of course, the closure or restriction of services. So all of these are things we are talking about in the context of COVID-19, but there has been evidence from previous pandemics and epidemics pointing to the same thing. So the question is, how do we make sure we learn from these? Policy recommendations, I think we've heard many of these before, but the review points out to these. One is clearly the need for psychosocial interventions responding to children, particularly in vulnerable circumstances. This should be retained and, and sustained during all kinds of uh, res service restrictions because it is absolutely key. Uh, and then stigma and discrimination, again, was something that we felt uh, that came out very strongly from this experience about how you use information campaigns to prevent lockdown or fear of disease spread being concentrated or, or um, you know, attached to particularly vulnerable groups, excluded groups who already uh, are you know, on the margins of, of, uh, of society and to reduce the kind of violence they might face. Uh, the investment in social protection has come up strong, but it's clearly a very strong protective factor in the immediate aftermath to prevent some of the risks uh, and the stress that goes with, uh, with uh, the impact of these pandemics and epidemics. This is, a, I mean, we've talked about it. How do you keep these services going uh, even in the context of pandemic? We better learn about this because we're gonna to have to live with these kinds of outbreaks. They're cyclical, not necessarily linear as I think uh, someone said earlier. And then of course the school access uh, and the equity issues in particular around school access are enormous and uh, these need attention. Uh, just to end, I don't know how much time I have, but just to end that we have uh, some primary research recommendations we could do much more to have rigorous retrospective studies, uh, you know, with the data we have from previous pandemics. Could we look, you know, at those data sets and then go back and perhaps revisit those areas and see what happened, what was the learning? So much more to do with learning from previous pandemics and epidemics than perhaps we have done. Um, qualitative research being very important. Uh, focus on children, but keeping in mind uh, this issue that the strong burden of proof for data collection is essential as the previous component of this uh, session uh, talked about, and the broadening of the geographic focus. Like there are some areas like SARS, MERS, et cetera, where we don't, and it could be a language issue. Although we didn't restrict for, for language, it was uh, uh, mostly English language based. So I think a lot of work to be done to improve our use of existing evidence. And that leads me to the final slide, which is you know, secondary research and synthesis. We've talked about some of this already, looking at administrative data, doing more deep dives into the evidence on HIV AIDS perhaps, and then the synthesis of evidence, doing more synthesis of evidence um, uh, on interventions to reduce, reduce child protection. So I will stop there. I think that was my last slide and um, I hope I stuck to time. So over to you, Selena. Thank you very much, Ramya. Um, and there was a couple of questions. If you could share the, the report as well with everyone, that would be great. Um, so we did plan for a, another small breakout um, group to discuss a couple of questions we had, but I think given the time, um, we would just like to open it up to the panel. So if you have um, questions, please post your questions again. Um, Shivit will also be joining the panel. Um, and I think Katrina just shared with you the link to Mentimeter where you could post your questions. Also, the, we're just posting the two questions we had for you for the breakout rooms. So that might, um, be, that might spark some reflections from you all participating as well. Um, so over to you panelists. I think some questions will be coming through. So we'll wrap up in about um, six minutes. So any reflections from you, Ramya, 
Danny, Georgina. I, I'd like to can give my space to Shivit actually, because he led the process and knows what it took to produce that report in, you know, condensing 6,053 and, and, and looking into it. So I'd like to hand space to him. Hey there. Yeah. Um, sh yeah, Shivit here. Thanks, Ramya. Thanks for presenting the, the review. I think you did a really great job. Um, I don't know if I have much to add because I think Ramya did such a, such a great job in presenting it, but I think sort of maybe reflecting on some of the comments that were made earlier after the, the first series of presentations around, you know, uh, what kind of, what more evidence do we need? Um, you know, do we need to kind of spend time generating more evidence or is it time for doing practical things and actually taking action? And I think thinking about the findings of our review, I think part of the answer to that or part of my answer to that might be in knowing what works and how things work so in our in our review we identified a number of risk factors that lead to um, risks for, for child protection different child protection outcomes and maybe part of the answer is knowing what works what kinds of interventions and services are effective in sort of reducing those risks so we don't end up with some of these negative outcomes and i still think there needs to be perhaps more work done on you know, uh, what kinds of interventions work uh, to combat things like orphanhood or um, or some of the other, you know, some of the other harmful practices we identified uh, within our review. So for me, one of the strongest recommendations is, is you know, that the, the, the need to do, you know, collate more evidence and th synthesis on what works, possibly based on some of the risk factors we identified. I think that's the main kind of message I wanted to pull over. Thanks. Thank you. And um, touching on that, there seems to be a few questions around um, providing concrete examples of implementing the recommendations. Um, maybe you can all speak to that. Yeah, um, we didn't, I mean, we didn't look at, uh, one of the things that we didn't look at was actual uh, intervention effectiveness in the review. So we were looking at studies that looked at the the impacts of the you know pandemic or epidemic or the associated control measures so i don't know if i can speak much to concrete examples of implementations but we covered such a broad kind of area that i think the, the also the interventions that you know uh, speak to some of these risk factors are also a really broad set of interventions and maybe some of that evidence is already there in other studies so i don't know if i can really speak specifically to that but i think it's also quite a big question and and maybe related to my point about how how we follow up with uh, getting more evidence on what is effective and, and what works and how things work thanks thank you danny and georgina did you have anything to add i think thinking of a concrete example um so in terms of the mhpss um findings of the study one of the the striking findings for me was um the connection the peer-to-peer -peer connection between the children and the importance of that and we are already seeing in um one of our country or some of our country offices where uh, particularly that connection um is being supported so setting up of um whatsapp groups basically as part of the the program where we reach out uh, remotely to to children um in um camps um they have also been put in touch with each other and set up safe spaces for them to meet and and um, be together and connect to each other and um our programming uh, colleagues have mentioned the tremendous impact it had on on the children's well-being so I think that's one example for me that um, stands out. And we had a question about um, reaching children in remote locations, so refugee children. Um, did the studies include that? Nomadic pastoralist children. Um, I, can, I mean, I can make a comment in terms of the, the review and our kind of synthesis of evidence. Of my, 
I think from what we found, there was a real kind of lack of courage of different vulnerable communities. So if we're, if we're sort of classifying children in remote locations or difficult to access locations as you know, a type of uh, population in vulnerable circumstances, then really we didn't see that level of detail in, in the evidence base that we collected for the review or disaggregation. And, and that was another one of our recommendations. Thanks. Okay, any, um, just have a couple minutes here before wrapping up. So any uh, final comments um, from any I of you panelists? That, yes. I'm quite right happy to, yeah, I'm quite happy to come in, Selena, if that's okay. Yes. Just to say that on in, in terms of the recommendations, you know, I think um, a lot of what we did on the review was to give, you know, support to the efforts already underway to advocate for for example, increased social protection, better responses to education, uh, you know, closure and to ensure equity. So I think in a way, the multi-sectorality of the response was also highlighted by us. And I think a lot of those uh, actions are being taken by people outside also of child protection in partnership with child protection. And I think that's a really important message. It's not gonna be one thing on its own, but really a com complete comprehensive understanding of all how vulnerabilities play out for children and lead to child protection impacts. But those vulnerabilities come from uh, variety, you know, various dimensions of their lives and we need to have a very joined up kind of approach. So I would just want to say the, imp I, the recommendations and the implications are actually for multi-sectoral action, uh, which will in the long term be protective for children. So, I, uh, so in addition, of course, to the specific services we need to have for children who are affected. So I'll um, stop at that. Yes, thank you. Great way to close and very important point. Um, so I wanna thank all of you um, for presenting today and for sharing your knowledge and learning with the work that you have been doing. Um, and I hope all of um, you who are participating um, will, will pick up these reports and review them. Thank you so much for your participation. And to the presenters, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, just one last point. Um, next, um, if you are all staying on, we'll take a 10 minute break to give you all some time to step away from your screens um, and to make your way to whichever room you'd like to join for the next round of topic sessions. Um, so you'll have to leave this Zoom room, find the next session you're interested in joining in Kiko chat, click on the joined for the next session, and then click on the green Zoom link button to join the meeting in Zoom. Um, and feel free to do that now because the next thematic sessions um, will have a cap on the number of people that they will allow. Um, so you can do that before you have a little 10 minute break. Um, so thanks again for all of you for participating and thanks again for our presenters.